Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this COVID-19 telephone town hall with the Tri-County Health Department and the counties of Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas. If you'd like to ask a question, simply hit star three on your telephone keypad and an operator will come and take your question. If you're listening online, you can type your question into the question box on the website. My name is Dirk and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're focusing on the COVID-19 vaccination rollout and distribution plans in this area. As you probably have heard, there are now two FDA-approved COVID-19 vaccines, and all three counties wanted to help our residents understand what the distribution plans for these will be. Tonight, we'll give you a status update on COVID-19 case numbers in the Tri-County area, and we'll answer any questions you have about the vaccines and when and where you should expect to get them. Given that this is part of a nationwide vaccination effort, as you might imagine, this is a very complex undertaking. That's why we want to get to your most pressing questions as quickly as possible. We do have a lot of ground to cover tonight, and we'll focus most of our time with representatives from Tri-County Health. But first, to kick things off, let's welcome Arapahoe County Commissioner and Board Chair, Nancy Sharp. Thank you, Dirk, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. We're pleased to be joined tonight by officials from Tri-County Health and Adams and Douglas Counties. 2020 was a very difficult year, and the recently concluded holiday season, along with the colder weather, may present our biggest challenges yet in terms of controlling the spread of COVID. But the recent federal approval of two vaccines means we can now see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. We want to get you as much valuable information as possible from tonight's discussion. So please stay tuned and ask any questions you may have. We have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm gonna now hand off to Roger Partridge, who's the Douglas County Commission Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Sharp, and thank you everyone also for joining us. We really appreciate it. We want you to know we feel fortunate that some vaccinations are now available, and hopefully soon this will be an option for everyone who wants to receive one. Given the volume of people involved in all aspects of this process, coordination and clarity of information will be crucial to make sure these vaccines get to the right people as quickly as possible. That's why we've invited Tri-County Health officials to walk through this process. With that, I will now turn it over to Adams County Commissioner and Chair, Emma Pinter. Thank you for that, Commissioner Partridge. Yes, um, I agree with my colleagues. Um, we're really lucky to have these experts here from Tri-County Health Department to help us with this really technical issue. There are a lot of factors involved with getting these vaccines to people as efficiently as possible. And we are here uh, as the three counties in Tri-County Health Department to share the latest information we have. I'll just turn it back over to our moderators so we can get back to answering these questions. Thank you very much, commissioners, for setting the stage for tonight's discussion. As a quick reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please dial star three on your telephone keypad to get connected to one of our operators. Now, let's bring on Dr. John Douglas with the Tri-County Health Department to give us an update on the current COVID status in the Tri-County area. Uh, thanks, Dirk. Great to be with everyone this evening. Uh Commissioners have been fantastic partners to Tri-County as we went through what Commissioner Sharp correctly described as an unbelievably difficult year. We're hoping 21 is going to be better and bring the end of the pandemic uh, uh, by virtue of the vaccines that have already been referred to and that we'll be talking about tonight. Let me set the stage for where we are, and then my uh, colleague, uh, Caitlin Wolf, who's leading our vaccine effort, will be able to provide some more detail. Um, we remain in a, uh, a difficult uh, time uh, from the uh, uh, perspective of the COVID pandemic. Um, Colorado is actually faring somewhat better than many states in the country. When we look at our case numbers as a state, we rank about 
16th uh, from the top. That's that's good. Better to be near the top. Um, we have been as low back at the beginning of December as like 12th from the bottom. So that's a really major improvement. A lot of that improvement is based on what's happened in Colorado. Um, we uh, had our uh, historically record high rates about the week before Thanksgiving. We were seeing record number of cases, record number of hospitalizations, record number of deaths. And frankly, December looked like it was going to be a gloomy time indeed. Um, I think largely because our residents of our counties and our state begin to hear the messages, begin to change the behavior of really gathering with others, which was a big driver, and continuing and maybe even improving wearing masks. We've seen over the last six weeks sustained improvement. Um, we are not out of the woods by any means, uh, but we are uh, de definitely better than, they w w than we were uh, back before Thanksgiving. As Commissioner Sharp referred to, we did just finish uh, what I hope for everybody was a wonderful holiday season. But part of the wonderfulness of the holidays is sometimes, uh, you know, giving in, at least in this pandemic year, to the temptation of engaging in social interactions with our, our friends and relatives and whatnot. So we're still watching very carefully to see whether or not that's going to result in, a, in an increase in January. We've had a few clues that that might be happening, although nothing definitive at this point. So I think part of the big message here is that as we get ready eagerly and uh, frankly, you know, I, I know there's frustration about how quick the vaccines are getting rolled out for those vaccines. We've got to keep ourselves steady, focused on the things that have really made a difference. Those things that have made a difference are the things we've been hearing about really since the beginning of the pandemic, um, which is the social distancing and hand washing and staying home if you're sick and wearing a mask, uh, which you are probably, you can recite it in your sleep kind of thing, but those are the things that really have borne us in good stead and I think will bear us in good stead. You're going to hear in a second that the amount of vaccine we have is not enough for everybody who needs it and wants it right away. And as we work, work through a distribution process, those of us who haven't gotten it yet need to be really careful that we prevent or, or reduce behaviors that could transmit infection. Um, I, I want to point out that testing, if you are sick, remains important. Uh, testing is, is as or more available than ever, so don't forget about that important uh, step. Um, and it's early January, but honestly, it's not too late to get the flu vaccine if you haven't gotten it. Uh, this has been an unbelievably mild flu year so far, knock on wood, but that could change. So while we're waiting to get our uh, COVID vaccines, let's not forget that we've got a very effective uh, alternative vaccine, a flu vaccine that can prevent not COVID, but influenza. Um, so uh, again, we're, we're hoping for a Happy New Year, a happy 21, and hoping for a time that we can all begin to get beyond the pandemic. And I think if we can maintain our steadiness in practicing these prevention cautions, or precautions, uh, we'll uh, get to that point in time with as many of us healthy and well as possible. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you very much, Doctor. Now we are queuing up some questions now, and if you have one you'd like to ask, please press star three on your telephone keypad. Right now, we'd like to invite Caitlin Wolf, Tri-County's public health nurse and COVID-19 vaccine coordinator, to walk us through the specifics of the vaccination process. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you. So as many people on the call probably know, we of course utilized our first doses at the end of December for our highest risk healthcare, healthcare workers. The goal of that being that, heaven forbid, anybody have to be in the hospital, that we want those, that population able to take care of anyone who ends up there. We are swiftly finishing up that group of people and moving on to um, other healthcare workers who are slightly um, less high risk and other first responders to maintain a robust healthcare system and public safety. And as I think many people on this call are aware, um, as of last week with Governor Polis's announcement, People 70 and over are now eligible to receive the vaccine. Now we understand it's very frustrating that eligible has not yet equaled access. And so I think that's part of what we're trying to 
answer tonight. Um, Tri-County sent out a great, and that's now posted to our website, information trying to outline the number of people that are in each group that needs to be vaccinated so that you can understand we are trying as swiftly as possible to have the number of doses coming into our state every single week reach the maximum number of people. But that the reason we're in a tiered system is because in the world, as you may know, we don't have enough vaccine for everyone. Um, and so we're trying to ethically and responsibly go through those tiers. So for people who are 70 plus, which I think is probably the top question tonight, please do expect that more and more places will start offering it. But eligibility, unfortunately, did not always equal the ability to open clinics immediately for that population. But I talk to partners every day who are quickly figuring out places that they'll be offering vaccines to people who are 70 plus, including hospitals, including federally qualified health centers. I think a lot of partnerships are looking at senior centers, et cetera. I think the good news versus if you're a healthcare worker is there won't be quite as much closed scheduling, meaning right now if you're a healthcare worker, you need a very specific invite from a hospital or a health department in order to make an appointment to, so you can demonstrate your employment. But demonstrating your 70 plus is rather simple. So that's a great uh, barrier that gets removed once scheduling is opened. And I've seen some um, portals that are being built as we speak so that it should be very simple, I hope, to sign up for appointments. Um, and we understand your frustration. We are grateful that you are so interested in the vaccine and beg your patience as everyone tries really hard to bring that capacity to our entire community. Thank you so much, Caitlin and Dr. Douglas. That was a lot of great information and certainly very relevant. Now we would like to take some of your questions. If you haven't already gotten in the queue to ask a question, all you need to do is dial star three on your telephone keypad to be connected to an operator. And uh, I think it, it certainly bears repeating since I am seeing a number of questions in the queue here, uh, Caitlin, that they're very much about what you just spoke about. And that is, this number one question, what 70-year-olds and over need to do to get the vaccine? So, Caitlin, can you, uh, uh, to, to reiterate the process now? Certainly. So we expect um, that basically all of our hospital partners in our three counties, and including in the metro area, um, or most of them, should be opening clinics for 70-plus as well as a variety of safety net clinics like Stride Community Health Centers, like Clinica, all those kinds of places that um, so serve robust portions of our population. And as is everything, right, in healthcare, their scheduling systems will all probably look a little bit different, but the role of the State Health Department and Tri-County will be to collate that information. So as soon as we have good, clear information, so you can click links and get to where you need to go, it will all appear, I think, on both of our websites. And that is something we are actively pulling together right now. So I hope that those web pages will serve as a great place to direct you to the facility that is closest to where you live. Um, if you prefer phone, our call center will also be provided that information as well so that they can help people understand the closest sites um, compared to where they live. But again, I understand right now it is, it is deeply frustrating because that doesn't exist yet. Um, and I can just assure you we are working as quickly as possible to make sure it exists very soon. Um, please know also, though, that we, as a state in Colorado, get vaccines allocated from the federal government every single week, and the, the shipments are not uh, huge amounts at present as we ramp up uh, the vaccine supply and manufacturing capacity. We are also, with our weekly allocations, not only sharing that with healthcare workers, we're sharing it um, with our long-term care facility residents and staff, who, as you all know, are also at very high risk. So uh, as more clinics come online, those opportunities will be made available, but there will not be enough appointments instantly to cover the more than half a million people in the state of Colorado that are 70 plus. Um, and so I know, again, it's really hard to hear when it's been a long, hard year and everyone's so excited about vaccine that not everyone will be vaccinated next week, but we will bring online more and more opportunities um, as the weeks go by. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And now let's go to the phones. We've got uh, Tracy in Adams County, and it looks like a question that uh, it'll be addressed to you, Caitlin. So first, Tracy, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, is it me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I'm Therese, and that's why. Um, it's okay, but Tracy, I'll take. 
Um, yes, um, I am a caregiver of a 91-year-old mom, and you just told me of 70-plus. The thing is, I've been tested at sites, but um, I'm asking, do we have to register online? Because that was really hard for me. Um, I went through phone calls and having to go up there, and it was just days before finding out. If if seniors do not have phone, I mean, online access to register, is that going to complicate how they find out? Because when I found out I was negative, they um, they did not have my name on the paper. They just, because it was someone else's computer. I think that's a great question and a relevant one I've heard in lots of planning conversation, which is uh, our 70 plus population maybe prefers phone, right, often, and, and is not our millennials who, on, who are on their um, computers all the time or, or online. So I cannot promise every single way that scheduling will be available, but it is a real consideration that we need to have phone um, options. And we should be working with our other partners like senior centers and others who connect with this population a lot to make sure a variety of options for scheduling are provided so that each population that will vaccinate not just 70 plus but future ones feel comfortable with the scheduling options offered and it provides access to everyone. So your point is well taken and, and very much being considered. Hey, Dirk, if I can add to what Caitlin said, uh, this again, we, we're probably sounding like a broken record as to how complicated this is. Uh, I do want to say that both our website and the uh, State Health Department website has got an increasing amount of information, particularly around health systems. And by health systems, I mean things like the various Centura hospitals, University of Colorado, Denver Health. They are beginning to create patient portals where uh, individuals can uh, seek opportunities for scheduling vaccinations. They're not all built out yet which is frustrating. And to get to Teresa's question, they do require a computer and require computer access. So for our, our seniors that aren't so computer uh, 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 facile or actually don't have a computer or have trouble with phone calls, as Caitlin said, we're working really hard with the State Health Department to figure out how we reach out to those people because they may in some respects be the most vulnerable of all and we, don't want to, and we want to be sure they don't get left out. Dr. Douglas, thank you for that additional information. Our next caller live on the line with us is Lisa from Aurora, and it looks like another question for Caitlin. Lisa, welcome. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, Lisa. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead with your question, please. You're live. Yes, I had um, a question. Um, I'm a teacher, and Governor Polis had said, last week that teachers would be in the next phase of the vaccine and right now um, we're hearing that we're not going to be having our vaccine until after everyone's 70 plus so that's looking like March. I was just wondering what the rollout for teachers was. Thanks Lisa. Yeah that's a common question. Uh, if you'll as many people may or may not have seen, um, the number of people and groups that are now in what Colorado calls phase 1B of vaccine eligibility, their teachers and other essential workers are now included, but there is a specific order to them. So actually what you stated is correct. Uh, hospital workers were first, then we are concurrently working on um, some health, other healthcare workers and first responders, and now additionally 70 plus. And then once that group has not 100% completed, but at least been offered sufficient opportunity to receive vaccine, will not move on to additional essential workers. Um, and, and yes, that will include teachers. So I think your March timeframe is um, as accurate as any predictions that anyone can make in something that is a worldwide logistical rollout. Um, and I, I understand it's, it's hard for everyone to feel like they're not first, um, but that is the, the order that Colorado has determined for the moment. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and everyone on the call. That is Caitlin Wolf, Tri-County's public health nurse and COVID-19 vaccine coordinator, who's live on the call with us tonight. We also have Dr. John Douglas uh, from Tri-County Health as well. And matter of fact, 
Dr. Douglas, this next question is for you. We've got Diane joining us now. Diane, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello. Yes, Dr. Douglas, I have two friends. They're in the medical field. They both had gotten COVID, and they both had gotten vaccinated. Why is it if you've had COVID, do you have to still get the vaccine? So, Diane, that's a really good question. Um, the answer is that we, we believe, based on comparison to other coronaviruses, that vaccine-induced immunity is likely to be more durable than immunity acquired from natural infection. That seems a little counterintuitive compared to something like measles, where we think getting the real thing back in the 50s might protect you more than a vaccine. But for coronaviruses, um, and other respiratory viruses, we think that, that a vaccine might work better. Now, we don't know that for sure. And there are situations, some of the hospitals said, look, we got enough vaccine for only 20 people and there are 25 of you. If, if five of you have already had it, can you, you mind going to the back of the line and let us get to the other people? Because we do think your temporary immunity uh, will protect you while other people who've not been exposed uh, are getting protected. But the but the reason for uh, offering it, and in fact, suggesting it strongly to those whether you've been infected or not, is got to do with the duration of immunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. Next, we're going out to Centennial. We've got Sue joining us on the line with a question for Caitlin. Sue, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Hello, can you Hello. hear me? Yes, Sue, you're live. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am 68. My husband is 72, so I know I'm not quite near the top of the list yet. He's uh, up there. We called our private primary care doctor, and he said he will not be administering or receiving any vaccines. We should just watch for public information. My question is, should we be going on to these different hospital portals, the, all those different places who possibly might be giving vaccines down the road here and signing up into accounts for all of them? Or are, are our opportunities going to be more generalized public, you know, come drive your car through and wait? I do. That's a great question. Um, to clarify for everyone, the reason a lot of primary care doctors don't currently have vaccine is that who can receive and administer COVID vaccine supply is very restricted in the country right now. Um, that's related to agreements people have to make with both their state health departments and CDC and be able to demonstrate a lot of uh, strict requirements around receiving it, administering it, and actually reporting the data back. We will expand the number of providers that are offering it um, over time, and that's actually happening right now because there's now so many more people eligible for vaccine, but that's why there's so few providers right now, and primary care doctors um, don't necessarily have it at all at the moment. So just for, for that half of the question. Um, no, I do not think you need to enroll yourself in a variety of different hospitals. When vaccination opportunities for 70 plus are available, it will be public information that we collate on Tri-County's website that the state health department pulls together. And I imagine hospitals will advertise it pretty well as well. Often with COVID vaccination, the scheduling applications are somewhat separate um, than a lot of sort of standard medical record stuff. So um, it may not do you any good to register anyway. I will say that if people have received care at hospitals previously, some hospitals have begun to utilize their electronic medical records to reach out to people that they already have in their systems. It's just the way they're beginning the process because they already have existing information for people. So if you do receive that invite from a hospital or a healthcare system you've been seen by before, please go ahead and accept it. That's how they're starting their vaccination. But they will all also open it up to um, broader sections of the public through more public scheduling mechanisms. All right, our next caller is Gloria, who joins us from Aurora. Gloria, looks like you've got a call or a question for Caitlin on the call. So go ahead with your question, please. My question was how... The Access Live event is in Music Hold. Um, 
uh, if you don't have a computer and you don't belong to a group that that will spread the word, how hard, how easy or how hard is it to get the information? Uh, I hope that was addressed a little bit as well previously, but um, to the point Dr. Douglas made, we are aware that not everyone has a computer or internet access and that vaccine opportunities, the more public facing they become for 70 plus and even future groups, the more options we need to have for scheduling. So that is an active part of our planning efforts so that just go online is not the only answer. And phone appointments, as well as really targeted community outreach to communities we know we're not hearing about opportunities are offered um, as we go through this. So, so please know that's, that's part of the work we're doing so that everyone has equal opportunity to get themselves scheduled. Perfect, thank you very much for reiterating that information, Caitlin. Next, we've got uh, Barbara joining us uh, live on the call from Bennett. Looks like a question for Dr. Douglas. Barbara, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Hi, my first question was answered because um, uh, the, the availability. My second question is, I have a severe shellfish allergy. Music hold ended. I read where the doctor in Boston also had that same allergy and he received the Moderna vaccine and he had a, a reaction to it. Uh, I'm a little concerned about that. What is coming out in the Bennett area? Is there a choice of Pfizer or Moderna? And my second question is, on the COVID-19 testing, I've got a, a lot of scar tissue in my nasal passage, and I'm wondering, is there another way to test to see if you are negative or positive other than the nasal passage? Um. Yeah, hi, Barbara. These are good, really good questions. Um, so the shellfish allergy question, um, I think what I would advise you to do if, if you're uh, in one of the groups at risk or eligible to receive the vaccine and you're interested in receiving it is to alert whoever you see as a provider about your allergy. Uh, now, the vast majority of people who have allergies are not going to respond to the vaccine, uh, have an allergic reaction to the vaccine. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control just published uh, a study and out of the first, I think, 2 million people that had received the vaccine, uh, a very tiny fraction, I think it was 21 out of 2 million, uh, actually had a reaction. And, and even among the subset who had a, a previous history of a se severe reaction, most did not. So generally, you're very unlikely to have a reaction, but you could. And what you want to do is, t is tell who's ever providing that to you, here's my story. Um, they're almost certainly going to ask you to wait in a monitored setting so that if you do have a reaction, uh, they'll be able to deliver uh, uh, treatment for the allergy, usually with an EpiPen if you don't happen to have one with you. Um, regarding the question about uh, a nasal passage issue, there are tests that can be done with oral swabs. Um, and what I would suggest you're doing is to call uh, different sites. I can't tell you right off the, uh, the bat right here which sites offer that, but it is an increasing option. Um, and I think you should be able to find a place that would offer it. Oh, I know you also asked which type of vaccines are gonna be coming to Bennett. I suspect it will be the Moderna vaccine because the Pfizer vaccine is the one that requires ultra cold storage. Um, we've got only a handful of places around the area that can store that vaccine. And so for places a little farther away, it has been the Moderna vaccine that has typically been used. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. And I'd like to uh, make mention of the Tri-County Health Department's website. You can find more information at tc-c-hd.org. Again, Tri-County Health Department, I'm, I'm seeing it here both ways. I will get confirmation, but it looks like it's using initials, tchd org for Tri County Health Department, um, and it looks as though there are no initial or no dashes in it. It is purely if you're looking for the Tri County Health Department website, go to tchd.org. And now we'll go back to the phone. We've got another question. Looks like for Dr. Douglas Soweta with out of North Glen. I hope I said your name correctly. Welcome yes, to the call. Did. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Go ahead with your question, please. I'm I'm going to be uh, flying soon, and so I have to have a test. 
uh, and it has to it has to be negative before I can get on the plane. My question is, I'm over uh, the higher end of 70s, and uh, should I ha- take a vaccination before I take that test? Will that affect that uh, test to see whether I have COVID or not? Um, I would not want to be uh, in the position to lo- lose my line on the airplane just because I took the vaccination if my, my number comes up. So that's a fantastic question. Um, the answer is unequivocally no. The vaccine won't modify your test. The test of the type that I uh, was just asked about vis-a-vis the swabs, test for the uh, what's called a viral RNA, it's the nucleic acid, um, and the vaccine won't affect that at all. The only thing it really would do is after about uh, 10 days, you begin to get protection from that first dose of vaccine. So it might actually prevent you from getting infection, but it shouldn't give you any kind of uh, uh, confusing results. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. So I've uh, got a question that's come in online from Roberto. And uh, Caitlin, I'll address this one to you. Roberto wants to know, do family members of people who have priority have priority themselves? That's a question we've heard a lot, because I think especially people who've ever done emergency preparedness planning are used to that. Um, We did a lot of that after 9-11, thinking about how we would do a lot of mass vaccination or mass um, distribution of of antibiotics. In the case of COVID vaccine, no. Family members have no higher priority just because they're related to someone who has priority. The priority is specific to the individual based on occupation or now age only, and that is purely based on the fact that we have a very limited supply. As well, the good news about vaccine, right, is once that person is protected with their full two-dose series, they better protect the family that they spend time around because they're less likely to pick up uh, COVID, for example, at work, in the case of healthcare workers, um, or in the community. So there is protection conferred to the family, but no, not op- uh, vaccinations um, opportunities. They're, again, um, dependent on individual qualifications, um, not other people. The other thing I would remind people of is the Pfizer product is licensed for people down to age 16. The Moderna product is licensed down to age 18. There are ongoing investigations being done by a variety of companies to to look at safety in children, but there is currently no vaccine product for children. So for other family members um, that we might consider doing things like flu shots and others for um, most of our young family members are not eligible for any licensed product at the moment. Thank you, Caitlin. Moving on now, we've got a question from Janet who joins us. It looks like a good question for Dr. Douglas. Janet, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question. I have a mother that lives in an assisted living facility, and I wanted to know that once everybody in there and all the workers receive both shots, and it's been a few weeks, if the... It looks like we just lost the call. Um, and so, Dr. Douglas, as my console was showing me, the question is, after someone in, a, in an assisted living facility gets the vaccine, does that mean that family can come visit? Um, Dirk, it's going to mean that uh, visitation is going to be a lot more open. We haven't yet developed uh, formal guidance, or rather the CDC and the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, who really developed guidance about visitations to long-term care facilities yet. I I will say that if everybody in there gets vaccinated, um, we will probably still be somewhat careful uh, in our openness because, number one, the vaccine works really effectively, but really effectively is not 100%. It's 95%. So we have to be aware that even if everybody got it, there's still some finite chance that there could be a risk of infection, and that's such a vulnerable group we'd want to be careful. Secondly, in most settings, not everybody has accepted the opportunity to receive the vaccine, even when it's offered. In our hospitals, for example, it looks like around 90% of staff are getting it. You would think everybody might, but there's some people with questions, and that might be the case in long-term care facilities as well. So I am confident that we're going to be able to have a more open environment in terms of visitation. I just don't know exactly what that's going to look like because of those two considerations. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. 
And our next question looks like a good one for Caitlin. And uh, it's coming from Judy, who's joining us now on the line. Welcome to the call, Judy. Go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, um, I'm calling. I was um, diagnosed with cancer. I'm now done with chemotherapy. I'm on immunotherapy. And I'm not going to be 70 until April. Where would I be able to get this shot, shot if I'm not 70 yet? Uh, thanks, Judy. This is not a great answer to hear, but there is no place um, if you aren't 70 yet that you could obtain the vaccine. There are people with higher risk medical conditions that will be prioritized over the general public as part of the phased approach to vaccine rollout, but they are not yet eligible for vaccines. Um, so I would say your best bet is when you turn 70 in April um, to take advantage of any opportunities that come your way. Um, again, I understand that a phased approach to vaccination is really hard for everyone, uh, given that we all really want to be protected from this terrible disease that has disrupted all of our lives. Uh, but the order is based on sort of a lot of ethical and medical considerations and the fact that we just don't have enough doses for all 330 million people in the United States right now. So we're trying to do the best we can at providing fair access um, over sort of roles of people that we need to be able to take care of us in hospitals and such. And as again, as we have more vaccine, more opportunities for vaccination will be available. All right, our next caller is Nathan, who joins us from Centennial. <clears throat> Looks like a good question for Dr. Douglas. Nathan, welcome. Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. My question is regarding guidance for taking the vaccine while pregnant. I know there were low numbers of pregnancy during the trials and therefore results were inconclusive. When do you expect us to have better guidance for pregnant or breastfeeding women? So Nathan, really good question. Um, you know, pregnant women have always been in this problematic area. People are worried about putting them at risk because they're carrying a, another life with them. And so they end up often not having sufficient data about various uh, medical treatments, including uh, vaccines. I will say that the American College of OBGYN has looked at the uh, the data and looked at what we believe could be the risk to pregnant women and looked at, looked at what we believe would be the benefit, and they have recommended that pregnant women should receive the vaccine. Um, their argument is that pregnancy actually is a risk factor for more severe outcomes, um, and RNA vaccines, which are not replicating viruses, not infections, do not present a risk to the pregnant woman that would be any different than it would be to anybody else. Um, the CDC has not yet endorsed that, and the FDA gave sort of a, I think, not very helpful answer, which is to say, go talk to your doctor, which kind of leaves it on the dock. Um, I think the CDC is likely to come around to addressing that at some point. I don't know when that'll be. Uh, there is no prohibition or rather uh, admonition against not giving it to women who are nursing. So if there's a situation, because once again, this is not a live virus, there's nothing in the vaccine that we think could get into breast milk or harm the fetus. Um, and, you know, to the extent that the mom stays health, healthier, um, that's to the benefit of the, I'm sorry, not fetus, but new baby. That's to the benefit of the baby as well. So pregnancy uh, remains ambiguous. I think we will be getting guidance soon and, and nursing shouldn't be an issue. Thank you very much, doctor. Now let's go to an online question. It looks like a good one for uh, Caitlin. Uh, this question was submitted by John who wonders, for companies that may believe they are essential manufacturing, how do they get a definitive determination and access for their employees? That's an excellent question. I can tell you that how it has worked for this first part of 1D that we're in, since healthcare worker and first responder has sort of a broad, unclear definition, the state health department went through and provided guidance that included occupational codes saying sort of these are the people that fit under this group of eligible people right now. I expect the same kind of guidance to be issued for essential workers as we move into the other part of phase 1B. It's not to say that you have to fit exactly into every category. There's some allowance for interpretation around the spirit of the intention of who should be included. But I think that guidance will help us provide much clearer determinations. Um, I think everyone can sort of think that how you screen for that when you're letting people schedule vaccination opportunities is not a simple, straightforward thing. So 
we are all trying to think about how do we ensure access to all kinds of essential workers that the State Health Department has said qualify under the next section of 1B. Um, and there will probably be a combination when people are trying to schedule appointments of asking for um, who is your employer, what is your occupation type, and perhaps even asking to see badges or letters from employers when people show up at vaccine opportunities. That's happening right now with healthcare workers. So I assume something similar will try to be transferred onto the next phase. There's no um, true approvals right now um, for those companies because we don't have really specific guidance as to who exactly is included and not. Um, but when obviously vaccine becomes available for that phase, it, it will exist and it will help us make some clearer determinations. Perfect. Now, keeping with this uh, Caitlin show, this next question is for you too, Caitlin. Uh, we're joined by Clint live on the line. Clint, welcome. Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. Uh, I was calling essentially uh, as follow-up to the previous question. We're in, I have a business in the judicial field uh, dealing with the public. Uh, we are wondering what portal, where we go to, but the previous question kind of lent information to that, except where we find out these occupational codes or list of essential workers. Where am I to go to find that out and where our workers who provide drug screening for the judicial system are fitting into the rollout? Thanks, Clint. Uh, the analogy of the year, maybe even Dr. Douglas has said it, is we are consistently building an airplane while we're flying it. So while I would like to see that occupational code guidance already exists on the state's health department's website and you could refer to it, it's still being created because we are developing a vaccine in under a year and rolling it out in that same year. Um, so please give us grace and patience with planning and trying to get you information as quickly as we can. Um, but when we move to the next phase of 1B, as I said, I do expect that information will be issued by the state health department to provide some very specific details on which, which occupations they're referring to for the next phase of 1B. You know, if I could chime in for a second, Clint, regarding the comment about the, the human waste, I, I don't know if this is urine testing or, or what, um, Urine is actually not deemed to be a, a biohazardous risk for COVID transmission. I mean, it may be for other uh, pathogens. For example, HIV can be found in urine, but I, I don't think that in and of itself, if that's the uh, sole risk of the person, would probably be interpreted as being uh, a, a category that would put them higher up the allocation. Their, their work may otherwise be essential, don't get me wrong, but I just want to clarify that about the hazard exposure. Thank you, Doctor. So uh, just for edification and information, uh, online you can find the COVID state website for Colorado at covid19.colorado.gov. So again, you can reach out and find more information on the state COVID website at covid19.colorado.gov. Dot gov. Now, moving on, back to the phones. We've got Valerie in Aurora with a good question for Caitlin. Valerie, welcome. Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you. Hi, Caitlin. Um, I'm calling. I'm an at-home parent who cares for a severely disabled child who is actually an adult. And I'm wondering where both my husband and I, who are the caregivers um, for a legally disabled son, where we and he would fit into this whole health care provider piece of getting the vaccination. That's a good We receive no money from the state. But the state is aware of his disability. But that's a great question. Uh, one I've heard before. 
when we talk about home health workers, at least right now, the way we're trying to prioritize them is people who are going into multiple homes. Because you can think, certainly all of us have COVID risk right now because we exist in the world, but healthcare workers that see multiple patients are more likely to both contract it themselves and, of course, spread it to other patients, which is part of why we're trying to protect people who visit multiple homes, for example, or take care of multiple patients. So those are the licensed home health workers um, that, that are being talked about in 1B um, and, and the people that are eligible right now um, versus people who are only taking care of one person, in this case, one person you're related to, in your own home. Um, there's no priority for that at the moment, though certainly I imagine um, you will have priority above vaccination um, for the general public as part of the phased approach for providing vaccination to people with higher risk medical conditions when we get into phase two. Thank you very much for that answer, Caitlin. Uh, Dr. Douglas, here's a question for you that came from online and wonders, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have a higher risk of complications from COVID, higher hospitalizations and higher death rates. When will they get the vaccine? That's a really good question. I'm gonna take a shot at it, but I'm gonna see if Caitlin might have to be smarter about it than me. Um, I think those, would, those individuals would likely be considered um, along with those under the age of 65 who have comorbidities because the caller is correct that, that persons in that category do seem to have more severe outcomes, like somebody who's overweight or like somebody with diabetes or has hypertension. So I think that's likely to be where they fall. I'm assuming, by the way, however, that this person would be over the age of 16, because at this point, there's some grayness, uh, given that the vaccine has not been tested. and uh, uh, sufficient numbers of people under 16 for it to be recommended. Caitlin, do you want to add anything to that? I do not. You're very knowledgeable. Okay. Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Uh, we've got uh, Sharon joining us on the line with a question for Caitlin. Sharon, welcome to this call. You're live. Go ahead with your question. I think Kaylin might have answered this a little bit earlier, but I own a clinic and we offer acupuncture, chiropractic care, and massage therapy. And I believe those workers fall into the 1B category. Um, I've heard from other clinic owners around Colorado that they've been contacted by a facility that they then will come on site to do those. Is that what I need to wait for would be my first question. And then the second, if they want to, if my practitioners want to go out individually and get the vaccination, I'm assuming they just need to wait until the state gets really firm as to what is in that 1B category and then be able to prove that and then go to a site. Is that right? Sharon, that is correct. Um, and I actually asked the state today um, for some further clarification on it on medical providers like like yourself um, so that we can understand that. But yeah, each health department in the state, as well as hospitals and others that are providing uh, vaccination opportunities to 1B medical workers, have been offering essentially closed invitations for appointments uh, when they basically find different facilities and working through their list of a variety of facilities in their area and connecting to them to vaccine opportunities. Um, so you are welcome also to reach out to our call center and say you are a medical provider in the Tri-County region and you would like to put yourself on our list. It's the one time there really is a list for a vaccine. And in our case, it's for people who are the primary contact for any kind of medical practice or group that needs to be vaccinated that hasn't already been connected to a hospital. And we are actively work, working to essentially play a matchmaker for with both ourselves and other places providing those vaccines. So again, please reach out to our call center. The number is posted on our website. Um, and they are taking down that information from a variety of medical providers and making sure that we get it and then reach out to them. Um, I will give you the note that it expect us to reach out if you've been put on our list in one to six weeks, because that is the time frame we're on for trying to get through 1B healthcare workers. So it could be very soon or it could be about six weeks from now, but once you've given us that information, we really do keep it um, and, and reach out to people. Thank you for that answer. And a reminder to everyone that's listening in on this call, there are two places 
where you can find up-to-date information on COVID transmission and safety practices. The first is the Tri-County Health Department's website. It's very easy to find. It's tchd.org. Again, the Tri-County Health Department's website is tchd.org. There you'll see a banner at the top of the website. It'll take you to the COVID section. Now, the second website is the Colorado State website for COVID information. You can find that at covid19.colorado.gov. Again, for the state COVID site, go to covid19.colorado.gov. Let's get back for a few more questions. This next one looks like it's for Dr. Douglas. We've got Lori and Centennial joining us. Welcome, Lori. Go ahead with your question, please. Yes, I have two questions. My first is, if you're a healthcare worker or firefighter and you've had vaccination one, you need to be wearing a mask and or completed vaccination two and still need to be wearing a mask. And then my second question is, for those senior citizens 70 and above that need some help with communication, reaching out, access to internet, or assisting to where they can go get a vaccination, is there a volunteer bank available for some of us to help with that? Lori, thanks for good questions. Um, first of all, uh, let's, let's start with if you've had two doses of the vaccine and you might be 95% likely to be immune. Um, clearly, I think at that point in time, the mask is of less benefit to you with a couple of caveats. First of all, it's not perfect. It's 95%. Um, secondly, if you're talking about wearing a mask as a first responder, of course, you know better than I do. There are other things that you could be exposed to. Um, uh, influenza would be one example. Those vaccines typically don't work any better than 50%. Um, but I will acknowledge that after you get two doses of vaccine, the incremental value of the mask to you and to the people around you is probably uh, substantially lower. Um, and I suspect we will be developing some guidance about that in the not so distant future. I, I think maybe the last thing I would say is that to the extent that you are recognized as a, you know, kind of a community role model, uh, you may get the vaccine before lots of other people do. And I, to be honest, feel like those of us that are community role models, part of the value of our wearing mask is that social messaging. This is something normative. This is something that is good to do. Clearly, if there's a reason not to wear it, you just can't get your job done, this kind of thing, after you've gotten those two doses, I think the incremental value is quite low. I would be a little more uh, cautious about after a single dose. It does, in fact, looks like it provides a fairly high degree of immunity. We just don't know how much and how long. Um, and your second question about, I think it was a call bank, that's a really good idea. We don't have that set up now, but because uh, as Caitlin has said, you know, several different times, we've we've sort of been trying to build a plane while we fly. And I think it's a really interesting idea for us to think about whether we organize that or try to get a partner to organize it. Because we've already heard lots of people tonight. I don't have internet. I can't check the internet every day looking for an appointment. So let me let us file that away as an interesting idea that doesn't exist now, but we should consider. Thank you very much, Dr. Douglas. And looking at the clock, it looks like we have time for uh, just one more question. Uh, this hour has flown by. Uh, this question will be addressed to Caitlin. It's uh, Audrey in Highlands Ranch who joins us now. Audrey, welcome to the call. Go ahead with your question, please. Um, hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, I work for a dental office and my boss, the dentist, he is in the over 70 category and I'm also trying to find out where, how we go about getting on some type of list to be called to get our employees vaccinated. Uh, thanks for that question. As hopefully I mentioned previously, 
Uh, we are actively taking requests from any medical providers in our community who qualify in the first part of 1B for vaccination who have not yet been connected to a hospital or other source like Kaiser for vaccination at the health department. You are welcome to call our call center, which is posted, that number is posted on our website. And what we ask is that you give us a primary contact for your office, so one person who wants to coordinate information for your whole office, what's their name, their email, their phone, and how many staff in your office are eligible for 1B vaccination, as well as obviously the name and type of practice that you have. And if you do that, we are maintaining a list. We are actively matchmaking those facilities with places that are offering vaccination. And we do ask that you understand that we will follow up in anywhere from one week to six weeks because we have so many healthcare workers in need of vaccine. And that is the current timeline for trying to complete distribution for that 1B healthcare worker population. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And for everyone on the call, we have certainly covered a lot of ground tonight and our time is almost up. I'd like to turn things over now to the commissioners for some closing remarks. So let's start with Arapahoe County Commissioner, Nancy Sharp. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. There were some really, really good and important questions. And I also wanna thank our guests for providing such valuable information and advice. We hope we've been able to clarify uh, any questions or concerns you might have. We urge everyone to review and follow the new guidelines closely and stay safe and healthy this winter. And I would like to now uh, hand it back to Commissioner Roger Partridge. Thank you, Commissioner Sharp, and I agree. Wonderful questions, and thank you so much for everyone who joined us and for the wonderful panel. Great job. And we'd like to get back certainly as normal as we can as quickly as possible in 2021 and we deeply appreciate everyone's dedication cooperation and understanding as we head into the home stretch of this battle against covid so thank you again and i will hand it off to commissioner pinter thank you so much and thank you so much for spending one of your last telephone town halls with us roger partridge i know you're retiring uh after uh this week so thank you so much um for your many years of service i couldn't let the evening go without saying thank you for your dedication i know we'll be hearing from you again soon um, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight i know we learned a lot of good information and there will be more information to come i know you're going to hear um, from tri-county health department quite a bit as well as the state's website tchd.org is Tri-County Health Department, tchd.org. And from there, you can link to our websites at the various counties or at the state's website. And as we get more information, you will have it. This is going to be a long process. Thank you for your patience and keep sending us questions so that we can get them in front of the experts at the health department. Thank you. And again, a hearty thank you to everyone who made the time for this live Teletown Hall tonight. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we will post a copy of this recording to our website in the next 24 hours. We hope you have a wonderful night. Take care.